Sai Baba, the embodiment of love. And I read that book three times. And I broke down and sobbed deeply three times when I read that. And what came to me was, there really is a God. We're not alone. Well, I've always had a spiritual orientation. I've sort of considered myself a cross between a psychologist and a minister. But I've always wondered, is there really a God? Mm -hmm. You know? All I can say was, there was something that touched my heart. You know? It, it was... When you hear the truth, or you hear that feeling, you have that feeling of love. It was a sense of love. There was like, oh yes, you know, we're not alone. There's, there really is something. Well, you know. Who is Swami? Swami is a man that has come to bring peace to the world. His, his life is an example. I mean, it's a, he's seven days a week since the age of 14. I just, mean, he knows everything. You know, I was in an interview, and after the interview, my mind kicked in, and I thought, oh my goodness, Swami doesn't want me here. And that night I had a dream, because he knows everything that's going on with you. And so, in that dream, Swami and I were two old men walking down the ashram road with our arms around each other, kind of hobbling down the street, you know. So <laughs> he let me know that, yes, you'll probably die here, you know. You're, you're, you'll be here as an old man, you know. And so it came to pass. Dr. Stephen Field's dream was to come true. Just a couple of years following this interview that took place in Puttaparthi, India, in January of 2005, Stephen Field died in Puttaparthi. Stephen Field worked as a psychologist with Sai Baba's blessing and permission, helping others in Sai Baba's ashram, Prashanti Nilayam. Welcome to Soul Journeys and to the story of Dr. Stephen Field. Stephen Field, psychologist, lover of Satya Sai Baba, pretty much a full-time resident in India, much of the time, most of the time right here in Puttaparthi. Uh, what drew you to Sai Baba in the first place? Pardon me? What brought you to Sai Baba? Oh, well, I, uh, I was in India in 1980, and I was in such a state of culture shock, I had to leave. And I had to forge my airline ticket to leave. And I had heard something about Sai Baba, this man that could work miracles. And I was so freaked out, I had to leave. So I left. <clears throat> and then it was like, I just heard something vaguely about him, and it wasn't really substantial. And then I went to Sweden to do a workshop. And I was supposed to have somebody energize me so I would have clients to work with. <clears throat> and um, they didn't do that. So I had a couple of weeks before this workshop that I was supposed to do, and I kept meeting these people said, oh, there's a workshop by a Jungian analyst. He's going to interpret drawings. He'll teach us how to interpret drawings. And so I said, great. So I finally said, okay, I'll come. And, uh, and that first day, we did drawings. And then throughout the week, we would have little teams and interpret each other's drawings with other activities. Well, this lady wanted me to interpret her drawings, and she was a real space case. I, I think she saw another space case. Anyway. <laughs> you mean so, in you, she I thought? Mean, yeah, and so anyway, and I interpret her drawings and with our little team, and she asked me if I, would I read a book if she brought it? And I said, sure. So she brought me Sai Baba, the holy man, the psychiatrist. Turns out she's a physician, has done a lot of work with lepers and so forth, save a you know, beautiful lady. Doesn't sound like she's a space case at all. Well, <laughs> she was kind of floating at any rate. <laughs> Maybe that was Baba's energy. <laughs> yeah. So I was so taken with Sai Baba, the holy man, the psychiatrist, I wasn't going to read another book. And my friend Monica, she bought Sai Baba, the embodiment of love. And I read that book three times. And I broke down and sobbed deeply three times when I read that. And what came to me was, there really is a God. We're not alone. So you're a man of science. You're a psychologist. Uh -huh. You're a well-educated human being. How can two books take you so far so quickly? Well, I've always had a spiritual orientation. I've sort of considered myself a cross between a psychologist and a minister. But I've always wondered, is there really a God? Mm -hmm. You know? what? What is this? All I can say was there was something that touched my heart, you know? It, it was... 
when you hear the truth or you hear that feeling, you have that feeling of love. It was a sense of love. There was like, oh yes, you know, we're not alone. There's, there really is something. Were you not raised in any specific spiritual tradition? Well, my father, my mother was Catholic. My father was a devout atheist. And uh, so he wouldn't let us become Catholics. And my parents were divorced when I was eight. Mm. And uh, so then at 10, I became a Catholic. I was baptized and went to catechism and those sorts of things. And at 15, I took communion. And then I dropped out because I felt hypocritical. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really have an any foundation as children we went to the Christian community church you know mm -hmm. so and I'm th thankful that I didn't get hooked <laughs> so as a free-thinking adult on a search for whatever is out there in in your adult years you found a spiritual center in yourself oh yes well I I had when I was about 24 I met a woman Neva Del Hunter who was a trans medium and she described how bright light came to her once and entered her and then after that she could know things and was different. And so I was on a men's prayer team with her, 12 across and 12 down for about 10 years. And we had week summer conferences every summer. Now what do you mean 12 across and 12 down? Well the 144, that's okay. what, you know the 144 yeah. the term from the Bible. And uh, I was in charge of the Bartholomew representative that which was imagination and uh, and that's kind of ironic because once I asked Swami in an interview I was wondering what is psychology what's psychotherapy I'm digressing here but I'll come no, back go ahead. and it was so profound what you know how Swami is with words he can say one word and it cuts through everything and it, before going into this interview I was wondering you know, what is psychology what I'm really doing with people you know and this woman, he asked her, what do you do? And she says, I'm a psychotherapist. And he said, oh, psychology, imagination. <laughs> That's it in a nutshell. It is, yeah. You know, we're all working with imagination, you know. It's, for some people, it's unlimited and unstructured and no barriers. And for others, it's very tight. Yes, and they know it's true, but it's still coming out of our mind, you know. It's, it's not what happens to us, but it's what we do with it that causes our problems, how we perceive it. So at any rate, and then I've been on a spiritual search for a number of years, you know, and I can remember it. I, as a child, I didn't have anything real profound, but I can remember I, I didn't like to fight, mm -hmm. didn't want to hurt anybody ever. And I can remember coming out of the house at age seven once, I guess. I'd gotten up and fixed myself some eggs. And, you know, it's a funny, I, I always will remember that feeling. I came out and the air was fresh, it was spring. And there was just something about that feeling that's always stayed with me. So you're a peacemaker and a lover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice combination. Yeah. So then I got involved with Zen Buddhism intensely. I, I, I went to Anchorage, Alaska. I moved to Anchorage, Alaska and took a job there as head of a psychology department and Alaska Treatment Center. That changed my whole life. <clears throat> my energy totally shifted. Uh, it became very yin, so yin, I didn't even want to compete. And all sorts of spiritual things came to me there. And uh, when I left there, then I got involved with Zen Buddhism. If I was involved with Zen Buddhism for about five years, every th three or four times a year, I would do a week's long sashin, which was where you go sit and stare at a wall for, for a day do that for seven days, five sort or seven days. Sort of like days. Swami's having people do in, in darshan every day now oh, since he right. doesn't show yeah, up so yeah. often. <laughs> so, this is again before your uh, reawakening into the world of Sai Baba. Yes, right? that, that didn't happen until I was uh, about 47, 20 years ago. So then you were on a decided spiritual path and teaching yourself and having others teach you a lot about Oh, the yes. journey. Yes, yes, absolutely. I'm always searching. And with Zen, you know, it was very intense. And Zen can be kind of philosophical more than anything else. So you didn't have any religious, strict religious underpinnings. You had the whole world of imagination to right. deal with. And, you know, part of it is, as a therapist, working with people, it's like, okay, what really works? Because a lot of what you learn in school doesn't work, and most of what I do has nothing to do with what I learned in a classroom. But what really works? What's it all about? And 
So you turn towards the spiritual. I think that unless you're dealing with the spiritual at some level, you're not going to really have a healing. Mm -hmm. I'll come back to how I got to Swami, but you know, there's three... Very briefly, before you go on that last comment, do your peers share that point of view, mostly or not? Well, I think probably a lot of them do. I think you need to have a foundation, which you get in an educational system, but it's... I think it's limited. I think that it that you need to go way beyond that. For instance, I think as a th therapy needs to involve three things from my experience. It needs to <clears throat> well, first of all, prior to that, we need to have three things to be healthy and happy. We need to have self-confidence, mm -hmm. which is one of Swami's teachings. We have to have faith mm -hmm. and we have to have love. And they all go together. If one's weak, the other two are weak. And so we need, there's four parts to therapy. One is we need to learn about the mind. And it's just, our mind of our mind comes all of our problems. And what's the mind? It's just thoughts. So it's really teaching people about thoughts. Some thoughts don't make you feel very good, some make you feel better than others. With awareness comes choice. Mm -hmm. You don't have to entertain them. The other is <clears throat> learning about feelings, learning to feel what we're feeling rather than going unconscious. And... Even the bad feelings. Even the bad feelings, especially the bad feelings. Because we push them away and yet that keeps us away from our own divinity, our own self. And we don't sometimes do it with the best of uh, reasons. Seva, we can become seva addicts or uh, work addicts. Yes. And distract ourselves yes. from the or very... Or spiritual public. addicts. Spiritual addicts as You well. know, rather than coming back and being present in the moment. The only time we have any life is this moment. Mm -hmm. There's no future because you can't get out of the moment to get to it. So now is the only time you have any life. So that means to be fully present with what's happening with you now. The difficulty is we also have unconscious thoughts that don't serve us. And so one of the ways back to that is to learn to feel what you're feeling. And that brings you eventually back to your own source, which so is all perfect and complete. If I'm following you correctly then, we do have a choice with our thoughts and we can choose to live in the thoughts rather than distract ourselves from them. And then with our unconscious thought patterns that can really mold the way we think consciously, you can learn and, uh, to expect that and know how to deal with it better once that happens. Is right. that what it's, you're saying? Yes, it's learning some tools. Mm -hmm. And uh, with awareness comes choice. So you don't have much control about what happens out here. There's, you can't control another person. You can't truly control your environment. You can put locks on the door, but there's fires, floods, earthquakes, burglars, all sorts of things. So what can you have control of? Not much, but on an inner level, with awareness you have a choice about how you choose to respond. Now you've used that phrase two or three times, with awareness you have choice. Exactly. And you know as well as I do, I'm sure, that one of Sai Baba's sayings that's been popularized is that we have about as much free will as a, a donkey tethered to a hitching post. Right. But that donkey does have enough free will to lift or lower its head, and you're suggesting we also have enough free choice or free will to change our thoughts. We don't have to entertain thoughts that don't serve us. Mm -hmm. We do have a choice there. Yeah, absolutely. We do have free will in that one area. With awareness comes choice. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, if you're aware that you're angry, then you have a choice to use that as energy and hopefully constructively. But you might choose not to, but it can still be a choice at that point. If Where's the anger coming from? How has it uh, been allowed to resurface yet again on a similar pattern after so many years? Well, you may not know where it's coming from, and it might be a habit, it might be coming out of a... you lock yourself into a groove, groove or an old pattern. But anger <clears throat> is merely coming out of helplessness. There's helplessness. no helplessness, there's no anger. That sounds pretty simple. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, absolutely. In other words, we almost, by definition, need be helpless in order to have anger. Yeah, we're blocked. You know, something will not happen or something will happen that we don't want, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, behind anger is fear. So it's really coming back to seeing that, you know, oh, I'm feeling helpless. So, okay, feel helpless. Drop into that feeling. Experience it. Don't run for it, from it. But again, you have to be aware that, oh, that's what you're feeling. Now, I'm probably going to 
continue to jump around from pillar to post, but we'll get back to all the points I hope that you want to convey. This seems like a good jumping off point to talk about what you do specifically inside Sai Baba's ashram every day, every week. Mm, okay. And you're the only one who does this, I believe. Yes. Well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm a counselor, I'm a psychologist here, and so I have a lot of people coming from all over the world. And a they come for many different reasons. I mean, people have been severely abused, some people can be suicidal, some people um, have histories of addiction, uh, marital problems, self-esteem problems, depression, lots of different things. And, and when you come to Swami, your stuff comes up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so we get a, this is kind of like the fast track here. <laughs> and things happen more quickly. So I do a lot of kinesiology with people to show them attitudes and feelings that they have about themselves that is conveyed to them by their muscular response. I also do something that I call is the mother work. And that's, most people have a negative unconscious self-image that goes back to mother. And this is because mother is the most powerful person in the world. She's literally God. There, <clears throat> there's nobody that will have as much influence over you as deeply, pervasively, extensively for your entire lifetime as mother. Let me take it a one extra step. Do you share the belief, or maybe nobody believes it, that that anger, that feeling that we have, lack of self-esteem, might go back, in fact, to the beginning of our life with our mother, or even preceding it in former Both. lives? Both, absolutely. It can be what you bring with you, but we need a catalyst in this lifetime. This fits in with what I want to say is, mother is so powerful because we're conceived in utero, inside. And we're just vibration and radiation. So you're in her vibrational frequency for nine months. That's where this body is developing. Now, you can sing a song to a child inside, and after it's born, you can sing that same song, and they'll quiet down. Mm. Certain music will help plants grow. Certain music will also kill plants, acid rock, metal, and so forth. Now, <clears throat> let's just say, for example, that your mother was chronically depressed during this time. Well, that's a vibration in which you're very familiar with then. So later in your life, you might revert back to this because it's very familiar and thus comfortable. So also in utero, you pick up mother's thoughts, attitudes, values, feelings, upsets, whatever goes on with her. And you can live those out as if they're your own, just like a post-hypnotic suggestion. One man I worked with once, his mother was, he was being born, and, and his mother was trying to hold him back, and he kept hearing, he's not going to make it, he's not going to make it, he's not going to make it. And this, this man had, uh, he was an underachiever. He had so much more ability than he was able to really put into operation in life, you know. And uh, he was somewhat a transient person. And, And when he was being born, he kept hearing, he's not going to make it, he's not going to make it. Well, Because he, he, he had this feeling all of his life, I can't do it, I can't do it. So he took that and converted that. But who wasn't going to make it? The doctor. He was on the golf course playing golf, and the nurse kept saying, he's not going to make it, he's not going to make it, over and over and over. So he took this in. So we can live stuff out as if it's ours when we really picked it up from mother inside. Now also, when you at birth, you bond, and if you don't, you can spend a lifetime or many years making up for it. Mm -hmm. The first years of symbiotic relationship, you don't know the difference between you and mother, and the first three or four years, survival is mother. Mm -hmm. So there's nobody that will have as much influence over you as mother. Seems to me by the time these, they rattled 20, 40, or 60 year olds get here for the first time to see Sai Baba, and their spiritual path is burgeoning, and they've got a lifetime of untidied uh, psychological baggage, you would have your plate full 24 hours a day. Well, it's interesting because you know, a lot of people come for three weeks, two weeks, and so forth, and there's, there's some people here that live here more full time, and so I work with those too. But I'm not interested in doing long-term therapy. I've done that for 30 years or so, mm -hmm. you know, and so, it's finding ways to work more quickly with people. 
And this mother issue, I think, is the foundation of well-being. If you do not feel accepted by your mother at an unconscious level, you cannot fully accept and be with yourself. And if you don't feel that at a conscious level, that's proof you can't feel integrated with yourself, I would imagine. Exactly. Because if you don't feel it at a conscious level, more than likely you don't feel it at the unconscious right. level. But the unconscious is it's important because it actually overrides the conscious. And how do you determine if you don't feel it at the unconscious, if you don't feel that connection at the unconscious level? Well, again, with muscle testing. Mm -hmm. I muscle test people and they go weak when I have them <clears throat> think of their mother. And <clears throat> I have them think of all the people in their life, think of their mother. And I have, and with every woman they think of, even if it's a wife or a daughter or whatever, whether it's a man or a woman, it doesn't matter, they go weak, they lose their energy. And so if you think about somebody and lose your energy, it tells me that you want their love, their approval, but you don't think you're going to get it. Sai Baba have something to say about all this? I haven't really talked with him about it, but it's, it happened here. I mean, this whole process developed here. I came here six years ago, and it just unfolded. Somebody would say, what do you do? And I'd say, stick out your arm, and we'd go off, and one thing added another. And then I started to ask people, say I'm lovable. <laughs> say I'm not lovable. <laughs> say I deserve to be loved. <laughs> say I deserve to be abused. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. How do you get yourself abused? You know, how do you create that in your life? So then once we do this work, which takes, you know, two to four hours. It's an intense session, mm -hmm. although I'm finding shortcuts. But we shift that negative unconscious self-image. So then a part of it is also now you're teaching people to be their own therapist. And part of that's teaching them to feel what they're feeling. So I say, have a cup of tea with it. Feel it like you want to keep it. Embrace it. Don't try to get rid of it. Feel it as an energy, as a, th as a energy or a sensation. Drop into it without thinking about it and then see what comes up. Because there's a world of difference between trying to work it out with your mind, which is ego and wanting to be in control, as contrasted to surrendering to the feeling and seeing what that brings up. Do we all have work that needs to be processed, including psychologists living uh, in the abode of peace? With oh, such absolutely, a absolutely. You know, this is the world hospital. I would, I, I'm. I like to think I'm on the staff, and yet sometimes I have my doubts. You know. You know, this is the abode of peace, and one of it Sai is. Baba's favorite sayings is "Love all, serve all." I certainly see that exemplified in you every time I've met you, Stephen. But there are some. And I'm not just saying this. I'm trying to make a point here. There are some people amazingly close to Baba who don't, who don't wear that mantle very well. Love right. all, serve all, right. and it, it's either a test uh, or it's a, a chink in the armor somewhere along well, the line. Let me let me respond to that with a, a story from my Zen days. I, uh, one of my clients became involved in Zen Buddhism, you know, when I was and. And I was no longer there at that zendo, and, and she was going, and, and she told me, she said, you know, one day I, I asked the teacher, Coben, the sensei, and she said, you know, I don't know why, but you know, the people here aren't very friendly, they're not very nice, they seem very selfish and very self-centered, you know, and what's this all about, you know? And it was quiet, and he thought a moment, and he said, they're like persimmons. They're not very ripe. They're not ripe yet, mm -hmm. you know. And if you've ever eaten a persimmon that's not ripe, Sour. it's real. You pucker right up, you know. <laughs> well, that's a good explanation. However, one of the main reasons why I find people like my wife drawn to Sai Baba people, in general, is because of their lovingness. Their, oh yes. Their, their their the degree to which they're at peace even on the road to equanimity in some cases. Yes. And that's powerfully attractive. And more so per capita than I think I've witnessed among other peoples of other denominations of religions or spirituality. That seems to be a calling card of, of the people who are attracted to Sai Baba. Yes. There is a love and we're drawn by his love. And <clears throat> I was president of San Francisco Sai Baba Center for a number of years. and. A regional vice president, and you know, as a president of a Sai Baba Center, you know you have no power. 
no power whatsoever. And a lot of people in Sai organization think that because Swami's the boss and he's got the final word that they can do that. Mm -hmm. But we forget that people are drawn to Swami and come to Swami because of his love. And you have to, because you don't give people a paycheck in Sai Baba centers. You know, they can quit going, they've got their own relationship with Swami. <laughs> so it, it has to be love, and a Sai Baba center has to be a respite where you can come and feel Swami's love, where you can have, get in touch with his teachings and live his teachings. But I think this is one of the problems with a lot of people here that you describe that seem to be close to Swami but don't seem to exude mm -hmm. that. And I think part of that is people get caught up in his form. And, you know, we have to go inside. He says, I'm within you, you're within me, we cannot be separated. And he wants us to live his teachings and not just be attached to that form. And he wants us to take those teachings out in the world and share them, to share that love. I mean, his teachings are very direct and very simple. You've seen, I've always wanted to uh, have a discussion about that simple four-letter word, love, uh -huh. which, in my belief, is so grossly misunderstood by so many people that I'm not sure many of us even know how to define it properly. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask you specifically, especially because of your work and because of your association with Sai Baba, that is his calling card and there's no mistaking it. And right. the more I see people close to him, the more I see them understand that. But how is that different than people who have a love, let's say for the Dalai Lama, or, or the Pope, or Billy Graham, or any other spiritual teacher, a religious figurehead, who teaches, purports to teach love also. How is that different? The love that Sai Baba teaches. Hmm. I, don't, I don't know if it is different. You know, I think there's a different intensity. To be in Swami's aura, you feel that. I mean, if Swami leaves here, it's very obvious. Mm -hmm. it's, there's just a different energy, a different feeling. It's palpable, you're saying. Yes, in my work, you know, I did some work in the States this summer, you know, some of the mother work. <clears throat> and I was finding that my in sessions with people to complete the same thing were taking four to five hours sometimes. Here, it's two to three hours, you know, or even less sometimes. So. It, it, things work more quickly here in that mm -hmm. way. But what really is love? Yeah. You know, I think that love involves the willingness to sacrifice. If there's no sacrifice, I don't think we really have love. Mm -hmm. And that means to share, to give. To give maybe more so than you really have or you really want, but it means the willingness to sacrifice, to really put somebody else above you to reach out to them. Uh, my doctoral dissertation was, was on altruistic therapy. Really? And, uh, and uh, that could have been called love therapy, it sounds like. Yeah, and most people who have a problem are basically saying, what do you have to give to me? Mm -hmm. Rather than, what do I have to give? Coming from deficiency rather than from source. Mm -hmm. And so Swami, his whole life is giving, 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 giving. I mean, he's an example. His life is exemplatory of being present seven days a week. But isn't it natural or doesn't it seem to be the way we were conditioned to think that when we have something wrong, we're looking for to receive something from someone else to help us correct that wrong? And yet you're saying the correct approach is to give even when you have something wrong. Yes. I mean, it's it's like in my work with people, I want them to feel what they're feeling, their pain, so they can go past that because it's just coming out of the mind. Behind those painful feelings are negative thoughts. But they're saying to you, give me the help I need. Give me the solution to my problem. Right. Well, I don't do that. Uh -huh. I take them into it. I, I become a guide. I make them do the work. You know, I don't work as a psychic. I work, I'm their guide. Feel your feelings. Stay with that. What do you get in touch with now? What comes up? Okay, let's go back to that. Stay with that. So it's, in therapy, the third part, you know, it's like teaching about feelings, thought, and then the third part is regression work. Going back to earlier times where you've made decisions and are stuck and still living it out. And so it's that 
getting rid of that by going through it, releasing it. And then it's also, the fourth part is the spirituality. There is a mystery to life. You know, how'd you get here? Who are you? You're not your body. You're not your mind. You're not your thoughts. And you have to address that spirituality. Otherwise, you're not really doing it. You're still in your head. Uh, for the benefit of those who could very well see this uh, as it's distributed hither and yon, who have never heard of Sai Baba before, uh, this sounds like it's closing in on what sets him apart from other people. Because he isn't here to give as much as it sounds like he's here to teach you yes. to find what you need inside of yourself. Yes, exactly. Yeah. A lot of my work involves his teachings. Like I said, this mother work, which I feel is a contribution to the field, because <clears throat> if you don't feel accepted by mother at an unconscious level, and a lot of people wouldn't believe they had that, but most do, you can't fully accept yourself. If you can't accept yourself, you're looking outside. And you actually use the word God-like. Uh, so oh, yeah. we think of our mothers as God, and if we don't have God's approval, how can we be self-approving? Exactly. You can't fully be with yourself and sink into yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's really teaching them to be their own therapist, to learning tools. So a lot of people would come and say, oh, I never want to have that feel again, feeling again. Well, that's the best way to have it. As contrasted to, if it comes, it's okay. I, I can experience it. I've got some tools. I don't have to be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. You know. This is um, a marvelous discussion. and. Um, Again, I think people are interested in Stephen Field from a variety of perspectives. Your professional work is endlessly fascinating. I'm sure with an endless stream of people coming through the front gate on a weekly basis, daily basis. How about you? How has coming into Sai Baba's fold, as it's often said, transformed your life in some ways that you wouldn't mind sharing with us? It's like a different lifetime. You know, I first came to Swami in 1984. Uh, let me just briefly finish how I got here. Yeah. You know, uh, I read this book and then I came back about six weeks later to the U.S. and Dr. Sandweiss was in the phone directory in San Diego. So <laughs> he told me about a Sai Baba Center in San Francisco. And so I went there. And they passed out pencil and paper and said, oh, you can write Sai Baba a letter. Somebody will take it. So I said, dear Sai Baba, please help me come to see you as soon as possible. However, three of us bought this property, 21 acres, two houses, a pond, and a swimming pool. It's kind of a center. One person backed out and it left two of us to make all the payments. So this property has to be sold or financially taken care of. And <clears throat> we owed $55,000 on a second mortgage, which was overdue and payable. And it had been on the market for two years. And one person that backed out was very wealthy and not making any payments. And so we were property poor. Well, <clears throat> I found this person about uh, six weeks later that was kind of a spiritual teacher and they were looking for property. And they said, well, we'll buy it. And I said, I'll believe it when I see it. And they, they said, we're going to come and look at it. I said, I'll believe it when we see it. So they came, they looked at it. To make a long story short, this woman calls and said, will we hold it for them? And I said, well, you know, we really can't because we owe $55,000 on a second mortgage. It's overdue and payable. So we have to sell it to who comes first. She said, if I send you a check for $55,000, will that hold the property for us? <laughs> she had not met me. She hadn't seen the property, and we didn't have a contract signed, and she sent me a check for $55,000. Oh, my. So we were meeting at these different, she was a follower of Muktananda's, mm -hmm. and didn't know anything about Sai Baba. So we were meeting at these centers, and then a property closed on August 4th, 1984. And I came to the first Sai Baba retreat, which was in September, the first week in September, because Dr. Sandweiss was gonna be speaking, of course, he was in Mexico, so he didn't come. So that first Friday night, I put some babuti on my forehead and said, Swami, when shall I come? And I got late September. So I played with it, late September. But I had three visions just right in a row. Late September, I was handcuffed to the woman that bought the property. <laughs> and then my hands were bound with a piece of rope, just about like that. So I called Lottie, this woman that bought the property, and I said, you know, Lottie, would you like to go to India? And she said, well, you know, 
<coughs> only if my friend that planned our trip can go, because they had planned a trip to India and their trip had fallen through. And I knew that. And so she said, only if the guy that planned this trip can go. Here's his name and here's his phone number calling. So I called. And he said, sure, we'll go. So we got tickets for the 27th of September. And about 10 days before, I saw pictures of India. And I had these flashbacks when I was in India before and had to forge my airline ticket to leave. And I wanted nothing to do with India. Mm -hmm. And so I called Lottie and I said, Lottie, you know, this may not be the best time for me to go. Lottie says, nothing doing. We're only going because you are. Mm. Uh, just about like that. And I said, <clears throat> so I said, uh, well, you'd be going anyway, you know, maybe, and she says, maybe a month later, maybe a year later. And I said, would you like to go a month later? She paused, said, no, the time's now. So we had tickets. There was no way I could gracefully get out of this. I called them, you know. So all the way over there. You had to go. Yeah. I had to go all the way over there on the airplane, taxi cabs, you name it. I was in the middle. It's like I was being delivered to handcuffs. I was in the middle. I tried to get them together. They're good friends. I was in the middle all the way. So we got there, and it was Dasara. And <clears throat> it was like 50,000 people or so, you know. It was a lot of people. The Pune Chandra Hall was packed, and I was sitting in the very back. And I was going to come for a year to India so I could get it over with and never have to come back again. You know, I was going to get mm -hmm. as much of Sai Baba as I could in this year and never have to go back. Well, I was sitting in the back of the Pune Chandra Hall, and I was just devastated. I couldn't understand a word the translator was saying. Mm -hmm. Oh, what a fool I've been. So I walked back to the sheds. Jim and I were in one shed and Lottie in another. And, you know, it's like the Seva doll was there talking to both of them. And that's a person that kind of provides security and coordinates people and mm -hmm. helps people. And, I stood back and just listened, and he said to Lottie and Jim, how long are you staying? And they said, oh, just a few days. Well, they actually left the next day. My heart fell to my knees. You know, they were going to go touring India. But she pointed to me and said, oh, but he's staying much longer. <laughs> so he comes over to me and says, how long are you staying for? And I said, oh, just a few days, maybe a week. I was really disgusted. And he gets right up to me, puts his face in my face, and puts his hand on my heart and said, stay two months, open your heart. Wow. So I've never seen him again, and I, that had to be Swami. It had to be. So I stayed six months. Six months? And only left because I was initiated. <laughs> <laughs> and I left for two months and came back for four months. How long did it take to open your heart? Well, I came because of love. Mm -hmm. You know, I had that experience. But with, with reservations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, and two weeks after I was here, I had an interview. And it was a very significant interview, and I was going to quit practicing as a psychologist. And Swami told me mm. in that interview, he said, continue your practice. So I did, but I didn't know it at that time, but it became his practice, mm -hmm. you know. So, at <clears throat> any rate... Can we leave? Hold on one second. So, at <clears throat> any rate, I, I, I really was going to quit and uh, revealed to me later. I, I was in a, when I came back, he helped me with an office. He said two things to me in the very beginning of the interview, interview to let me know that he knew everything about me. Something uh, can very you share rough? I mean, you don't not, nothing private, but uh, well, it's you're private convinced it wasn't just a generalization that it was oh, right no, on. No. We, we had just sold this property. My partner, we sold the Grass Valley property, and at the same time that happened, my partner sold her house, and that's where we had our therapy rooms. So these are big events that just happened in your life. And, and, and so the people that bought her house said she could practice there until escrow closed, but I couldn't. So I was renting office space around town, mm -hmm. a couple hours here, an hour or two there at different offices, you know, to do my practice, because I didn't have an office. And <clears throat> all my life, I have wanted to be married, but had a gross fear of marriage. I mean, big time. And you're a psychologist. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, it was big time, you know. It was very dramatic. <laughs> and 
I mean, I asked one poor woman to marry me three times and backed out three times, you know, and <laughs> the last time I was deathly ill, <laughs> I had to cancel oh, she it. She had some karma. <laughs> really. So Swami said to me straight away, he said, you're disappointed because you're not married and you're worried about an office, but don't worry, don't worry, I'll help you. So he was right on. Yeah, absolutely. So he knew, it. I knew that he knew everything about my life. Mm -hmm. So. When I went back home, mm -hmm. not the first month, but you know, it was like there were a few months and he got me a very nice office. Mm -hmm. And I signed a lease with these people and I thought I was indentured. And it was an office with other people actually, you know, three of us. And so I was at this film <coughs> in the San Francisco Sci Center and after the meeting we were watching this film on Swami and I felt all of a sudden all this love, and I heard myself saying, oh Swami, bring me back, bring me back, bring me back. And then I heard a voice in my head, it said, are you serious, because I will. And I said, yes. And I walked out of the center after the film, and there was this woman about 15 feet from the door. She didn't even say hi, she just says, hey Steve, why'd you come to India with us? Well, yeah, where are you going? Like this was June, they were going in September. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, yes, yes, okay, but, 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 yeah, yeah, okay, but give me a couple of days, but yes, you know. <laughs> so, within two weeks of that, my practice more than doubled and stayed that way, you know, ever since. And so, Aren't these stories amazing? I hear them over and over. Oh, I know. You so, put it out there and you might get a check, do you mean this, and then it happens. Absolutely. So, I had another... I had a dream once where, that verifies this also. There Swami was in a large room, sitting on a couch giving a discourse. And there were some doors here with French doors, and then there was a front door here. And I was just sitting on the other side of those open French doors, maybe 15 feet from Swami. And it, when he was leaving, he walked around and right in front of me to go out the, the mm -hmm. front door. Well, Swami was wearing army camouflage pants and boots. He was? And so that told me that I was in Swami's army. <laughs> that's, that's a great dream. Yeah, it told me I was in Swami's army. Now, take me back to America or wherever you have other friends and relatives and siblings and family members who aren't on this same path. And they know you're smart, they know you're trained, and do they have any reservations about your association with this I had a guru twin, in India? I had a twin sister who, who died about six or seven years ago, and she was very threatened about my spirituality and searching. She was very Catholic. It seems so common. But I have another sister who's three years older, and she's become a devotee of Sankhya. Really? Yeah. Well, that's nice to hear. So, that's encouraging to hear. Yeah. But you know, you've asked how Swami's helped me, how I've shifted. Yes. You know, I was very insecure early in life and I uh, had gross feelings of inadequacy and uh, Swami's really opened my heart you know there's it's like part of my work with people is don't let anybody ever cause you to close your heart uh, that's where God is keep it open of course we're in God too but but uh, so there's a sense of my work has taken off mm -hmm. since I've come to Swami. You know, I was ready to quit. I'd worked in Anchorage, Alaska, and I felt very successful there with what I had done. And yet I came back to the U.S. and that's when I started a private practice. You know, I just never went back to working for somebody. And one thing led to another and so forth. But, you know, it was not much happening. But okay, is it, do I go? risk anything by trying to generalize too much by saying your previous life helped you identify people's problems and lead them to solving their problems your previous professional life and your current professional life does that and more actually enables them or shows them how they can open their heart uh, since you work with so many Baba people who are coming from so many armed yes, backgrounds. Since I came to Swami you know my practice has changed and I'm part of that precedes that too with my experience with Zen Buddhism with the intense meditation because we're not our thoughts and with meditation you can start to see your thoughts come up so you you have more of a choice um, if we're not our thoughts what are we 
that's a good question. What, what are we? You know, you can see the movie. All we get to do is watch the movie. And so what are we? Well, if you boil yourself down to one thing, what's left? Awareness. We're the awareness. And without awareness, we don't exist. <laughs> Poof, we're gone totally. But you can get rid of everything, but awareness is there. So we're the ever-present witnessing awareness. It's like if you wake up in the morning with a dream, scary or whatever, you can realize, oh, I'm not these thoughts, I'm not these pictures, I'm not this dream. I'm that that's aware of it. So it's coming back. That's the Atma. So the dream obviously doesn't have great meaning. The thoughts you're saying have no meaning. It's all illusion. Again, it's, it's imagination. It's, it's what we create here, like the dream, and also that relates to daily life. But we're the awareness that gets to be aware of this. So it's identifying more with this awareness, that which is always present and doesn't change. And, like, and how can you live in that state of awareness when you have expectations put on you every day by your boss, by your mate, your spouse, your children, your banker, and the people who need to have the bills paid? How can you stay in awareness there when there are so many demands put on the typical bear every day? It's very difficult. And this is where you have to build a foundation. <clears throat> you have to build a foundation that starts with meditation, with starting to be aware and witness yourself. It's like I worked with a person the other day who can go off like that, you know, okay, so <clears throat> she needs to start to be aware that nobody causes her to be angry. Oh, that's interesting. That's coming from within, what she's doing with it, how she's perceiving it, what she's unconsciously telling herself, which must be something like, oh, they don't like me, or I'm in danger, or trouble, or whatever it might be she plugs into. That's why it's important to clear out that negative garbage what goes back to that foundation of mother. Mm -hmm. So then you can start to develop and become more aware. And so you become less concerned about what you get and don't get. You, you come more from awareness of what you're feeling rather than in your head of I've got to be successful. So Swami talks about equanimity. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not being excited about the good things that happen or frightened about the bad things that happen. You know, it's having equanimity. Mm -hmm. And part of that comes out with solving that mystery, addressing that mystery. Who am I? I'm not my thoughts. I'm not my mind. I'm not my body. You are awareness. Who, I'm awareness. Who am I? It's coming back to that. And I don't mean to convey that uh, I'm there, you know, by any means. You know, <laughs> I still have my struggles and I work with this, but it's a direction to move in, you know. So... Uh, Forgive a very naive question. What's the primary benefit of awareness? When you're, your thoughts, you can build castles in the sky. When when you're this and that, you have history, you have a past, you can love it or hate it. When you're in a state of awareness, where does that take you? Where is it supposed to take you? The irony of it is, awareness is always there. So it's not something that you enter into and leave. It's always there. It's like the sky is always there. There's clouds that go through it, there's rainstorms, other things, but the sky is always there. So it's really who we are. It's getting that bigger picture mm -hmm. of that Atma, of that awareness. That we are above the thoughts. We are above our past. We're not we the are thoughts. Above. We're, we are apart and above right. all of that. Right. This is a wonderful discussion. In the remaining minutes, okay if I ask uh, for a couple of comments on this and that that I'm aware of only because it intrigues me endlessly and I'd like to hear from your viewpoint. Leelas. Leelas seem to happen in my estimation, the more I see people become aware of the leelas in their life, the more they seem to happen. Uh -huh. Why is that and where do they come from? What are they? Just coincidences? What do Synchronicity? You mean, what do you mean by a leela? Oh, thinking about whether or not I'm supposed to go see Baba in India. I've saved up my money, but I have several compelling reasons why I shouldn't go, perhaps. And I'm, wondering whether I should go and I'm driving down the road and a car in front of me has a license plate that says Sai Ram. Right. That's a Leela. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Synchronicity. Uh, does that fit your sure. definition? Okay. Well, 
There's my answer. I'm going to India. We're all connected. We're, we're all one. You know, and so how I think about you affects you. <clears throat> I can actually weaken you or strengthen you and demonstrate that with muscle testing. I can make you weak if by my mind. By you thinking about me. That's right. I can weaken you. I can make you go weak. I would guess the one exception might be if I'm in a state of equanimity, maybe your thoughts wouldn't have any impact on me. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but, I'm but, not there. <laughs> but we're all connected. So, you know, we, it's like two people on the other sides of the world who have never communicated come up with the very same invention. Mm -hmm. uh, Back to your first part. How can you weaken somebody with your thoughts? Well, I just have a thought about them that's negative to them. That's my experience. And even though they're in love, uh, they're in their own energy and it's mostly positive and they're outgoing and Well, affirming. again, you know, most people have unconscious thoughts and mm -hmm. at some level, most people don't really accept themselves. Mm -hmm. And this is what it's all about with Swami. You know, it's amazing to have Swami in your life because there's a sense of love. You know, you can meet somebody and have a relationship, a marriage or whatever, and there's ups and downs and so forth. But you can always come back and feel Swami's love. Mm -hmm. It's always there. And so it's like a stability in your life. It's like opening your heart. Some couples come and they fight and they say, oh, we fight about the most stupid things. That's because when they come or when they're fighting, their world's about this narrow. I've seen lots of fighting here. But when they come, into my office, there's hope. Mm -hmm. And so their hearts open more, so they're not so threatened. And now, they, because they have a sense of hope, so they have a bigger picture. So, Leela's happened, you know, where you point your consciousness is what happens to your life. Mm -hmm. If you want to become a drug addict, hang out with drug addicts. Mm -hmm. If you want to be in welfare, hang out with people in welfare. If you want to be successful, hang out with people who are successful. So, where you point your consciousness now, as far as the muscle testing and weakening somebody, most people aren't that focused. So it's like I have a focus when I'm doing that, but most people are not that focused. So somebody might be angry with you or have bad thoughts or whatever, mm -hmm. but most people aren't that focused, so it's rather diffused and, and not that significant. But if a person really, most people who are successful in life are focused. So it's learning to use this tool. So being focused can bring seeming coincidences into your life. Yes. Leela's into your life. Yes, absolutely. Because your focus precedes, part of, in many way, your... Part of what you're describing, bringing Leela's into your life, is being open. Mm -hmm. if, if you're upset, like the couplet comes, comes in and says, we fight about the most stupid things, well, they're closed. They're armored. Nothing can come in. But if your heart's open and you're not threatened, and you feel safer or whatever, you're more open so you can receive this. Let's graduate up the ladder one rung, miracles. I hear a lot of talk about miracles around Sai Baba followers. <clears throat> Many claim to experience them. Yes. Others talk about astonishing miracles <clears throat> regarding other people who are sick, uh, who are bankrupt, who are dead. Yes. Again, you're a professional. You work with the mind. What are these experiences? There are things that we do not understand, that science doesn't know how it happens, so we put it in a category of a miracle. But Swami can do it day in and day out. So <clears throat> there's something there with a higher level of awareness or consciousness that we don't really see or understand. Have you seen Leelas and have you seen miracles? Oh yes, absolutely, but they, they've happened throughout history. It's not just Sai Baba that's happened throughout history. So, it's happened to lots of people with, with healing. Uh, there's healings that take place all the time. I, I talked to one man actually, well, uh, he had money put in his bank account by Sai Baba. He, he was broken and money was put in the bank account over and over and over, went on for two years and he said that money was not his and he went to the bank even and yet every month there was more money there. Wow. So, you know, <laughs> Swami can work any miracle, but I think the greatest miracle that Swami works is opening your heart. And he says his greatest miracle is his love. Well, that's a lot. And yes, it's the total. It's the, it's the foundation. And yet we get caught up, you know, we get so caught up with he gives me this 
And we're so attached to what he gives us rather than the love behind giving. Mm -hmm. You paint such a vivid picture. The question, it's a cliche by now, is why aren't more people biting? Why aren't there more people trampling down the gates to Prashanti Nili? From all over the world? From all over the world, yeah. Uh, well, I think there are a lot coming, first of all. I mean, there's millions of people that come here, and they've come here from all over the world. All over the world, literally. Mm -hmm. and, and that's amazing because Swami doesn't do advertising. You don't see any articles in Time Magazine about Swami, you know, advertisements, you know. Uh, so he actually plays that down. So people come from all over the world, and this is the first time an avatar has been that open and that available. As far as why people don't come, I can speak about the U.S., probably much of the Western world, is most people are so caught up in fear. Most people are so caught up in materialism. I've got to have this. It's not safe. I've, I've, I've got to pay my bills, and they're locked in to a fear. Um, Precisely the motivation, I would think, that would drag people here You would think so, and yet, you numbers. know, <clears throat> to come here is expensive. I mean, mm -hmm. you're flying around the world, and I, I think that uh, in the U.S. and with Christianity, I mean, Christianity has a good foundation, and yet at the same time, there's been a lot of damage done through religion. Uh, so a lot of people don't understand this is very much an Eastern concept, and the concept of being devoted to a live teacher, to a living God. Oh, well, that scares people, you know? Mm -hmm. They don't understand that. Oh, yeah. And when I, I know when I first heard about Sai Baba, well, first about another teacher I went to the first time I described, I asked myself, if I'd lived during the time of Christ, would I have gone and seen him? <laughs> well, the answer is yes, you bet, and I get on an airplane and go. Yeah. And then I heard about Sai Baba. If I lived during the time of Christ, would I go and see him? Check him out. You bet. So I'm on an airplane and go. Well, I've asked many people that question. And they say, no, I wouldn't go. That stuns me. That's the sad part. So That shocks me. But, you know, it's, it's also related, I think, to the harshness of the Western culture, you know, way we're taught, you know, it's like, and I see this in men a lot more than women, but it's the ego being in charge. I've got to survive. I don't need anybody. I can do this myself, and I don't need anybody else. There's a sign of weakness if you have to go see somebody. A couple of minutes left. Uh, the other standard cliche question I ask is, who is Sai Baba? In your case, let me just modify that because this will be seen by people who are devout followers as well as complete strangers to right. the name, let alone the picture of Sai Baba, yet there he is sitting behind you. If you really were interested in conveying a sense of understanding about Sai Baba, though you might run the risk of scaring people off or intimidating people or making them think you're nuts, right? what would you say to somebody you really cared about that you wanted to share who this personality in your life is? Well, the first thing is your own experience with Swami, you know, and mine has been an experience of love, an experience of deep love, and, and opening up to a deeper spiritual level. I feel through coming to Swami, I've come up spiritually. When I was involved in Zen Buddhism, I felt like I wasn't ready to die. But when I came to Swami, it's like if I died tomorrow, it'd be okay. I, I would attach to his feet. I would be okay. You know, there wasn't a fear there anymore. Zen was kind of harsh. Swami's was love. Uh, who is Swami? Swami's a man that has come to bring peace to the world. His, his life is an example. I mean, it's, he's seven days a week since the age of 14. I mean, I couldn't imagine working for one year seven days a week, you know, let alone five days. I can do five days, but six days it even gets to be difficult, and he's doing seven days a week with people from all over the world who speak different languages. They all want something. Don't let this happen. Give me this. So all I can say is he's a man of love, and you could say he's, 
He's God incarnate. Of course, we're God incarnate too, we just don't know it. Mm -hmm. That's his teaching. You know, I had a, a dream of Swami once, just, he knows everything. You know, I was in an interview and after the interview, my mind kicked in and I thought, oh my goodness, Swami doesn't want me here. And that night I had a dream because he knows everything that's going on with you. And so in that dream, Swami and I were two old men walking down the ashram road with our arms around each other, kind of hobbling down the street, you know. So <laughs> he let me know that, yes, you'll probably die here, you know. You're, you're, you'll be here as an old man, you know. Well, that's a delightful story and so, dream and explanation. Dr. Stephen Field, thank you very much for sharing all that you did for oh, devotees and newcomers alike. It's my pleasure indeed. Sairal. Thank you, Ted.